Thanks to the organisers of this great event and thanks also for being here. As far as we know, there are about 7 billion people on our planet. And I would suggest that each of us is an agent of change. We're an agent of change in the way in which we interact with each other and we're an agent of change in terms of our interaction with the environment. Sometimes that can be positive, sometimes negative. This talk is about our blue future and I want to explore our incredible Australian biodiversity heritage and particularly focus on the marine environment. And I'm going to take you on a journey, an incredible migration journey, with our extraordinary humpback whales from their feeding ground in Antarctica up to their breeding ground in the Great Barrier Reef. But before we do that, I want to give this a global perspective. We live on a blue planet. 71% of the surface of the Earth is covered by marine environments. In that, we have extraordinary ranges of seascapes and on land, very large changes in the types of landscapes that are present. We think there are some millions of species on our planet, but we just don't know. What we really need to do is know more about our biodiversity. And by biodiversity, I mean all of the individual species, potentially some millions that are on the planet, their genes and the genetic diversity within each of their populations, the way in which all of those species aggregate together and form communities, ecological communities, and the way in which those ecological communities interact with their non-living world to form our extraordinary range of ecosystems. Australia is what we call a megadiverse environment. It's estimated that possibly as many as about 7 to 10 percent of the global species on Earth occur within the Australian landscapes and seascapes. What I'd like you to do just for a moment is all close your eyes and think about a particular species that is important to you personally. Okay, please open your eyes. Can I have a show of hands for people who thought of a land species? Okay. How many people thought of a marine species? How many people thought of a freshwater species? Okay, so quite a diversity of interests here. And one of the interesting things is, of course, we're a land-based mammal and we're mammalocentric. We are very interested in other mammals. So I'm going to try and use that interest in terms of the vehicle with humpback whales. Australia has a unique biodiversity. Most of it evolved in isolation over a period of at least 50 million years as Australia broke away from the Gondwana continent. As a result of that isolation, we have an extraordinarily large number of endemic species. And by that I mean species which exist nowhere else on Earth. So not only do we have an incredible national responsibility to protect our unique biodiversity, we have a global responsibility because there are no other populations for many of these species elsewhere on the planet. We have an extraordinarily large terrestrial environment, somewhere in the order of more than 7 million square kilometres. But our marine jurisdiction, our marine estate, is even larger, somewhere in the order of more than 10 million square kilometres. So we have a very big responsibility. What we do know about Australia's biodiversity is that it is declining nationally. A lot of that decline occurred after European settlement, and particularly in the southern parts of Australia as we started modifying the landscapes quite substantially. We also know that some of this um, diversity is declining at this very stage. So, for example, the Christmas Island Pipistrelle declined and probably went extinct in 2009. What we have is a serious lack of data about the conservation status for many of these species. We know that 1,785 species are listed on the EPBC Act, the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act in Australia, as threatened with extinction. There are another 61 ecological communities which are listed under that act as well. The problem we face is that we have very little monitoring of the species that are even on the list, 
and we don't have enough funding in order to manage them effectively. Amongst this, there is some good news. For example, the Lord Howe Island Wood Hen, which is located about 600 kilometres way off the coast of Eastern Australia. It declined for some hundreds, down to less than 30 birds. Some captive breeding program in the 1970s expanded the population and it's now stable somewhere between 100 and 200 individuals. So there are some good news stories amongst the carnage. There's also a good news story in relation to Australia's humpback whales, which were brought back literally from the brink of extinction. More than 200,000 humpback whales were killed during whaling in the southern hemisphere last century. That led to a 95% decline in the population. And the good news is, however, that in the Australian region, our two populations are recovering. What can we learn from the whaling lessons where more than two million whales were killed in the southern hemisphere last century? It led to massive declines. More than 700,000 fin whales, more than 300,000 blue whales were killed. And Antarctic blue whales are probably still only a few percent of their original population and are critically endangered. What we need is independent monitoring and management. When people use resources, they should not be in charge of setting the catches and the quotas for those resources. A similar problem is emerging in fisheries around the world. You may be familiar with the fact that there was a $2 billion fraud fairly recently exposed in Japan where they had extracted far more tuna resources than they had actually declared. And a similar undeclared, unreported catch is occurring now with Chinese fisheries. Humpback whales undergo an extraordinary migration from their Antarctic summer feeding grounds up to the Great Barrier Reef and over to the Western Australian coast in the Kimberley region. We know that whaling was the most serious threat in the Antarctic previously, but what some people still don't know is that there is still whaling going on in the Australian whale sanctuary and the Southern Ocean sanctuary for whales as well. Japan has self-declared a special permit in order to take about 935 minke whales when they can get them, and potentially in the future up to 50 Australian humpback whales. The other issues that are of concern in Antarctica are, are of course climate change. We know that increasing sea temperatures are leading to a loss of sea ice. We know that the sea ice is really important in terms of the microscopic algae that blooms as the water starts to warm again after winter and leads to a great swarm of plankton available for krill. And we know that many of the whales and other creatures down there rely on krill as an essential resource to fuel their long migrations back up to their breeding grounds. We also know that another part of climate change where the increased carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is being absorbed into the upper part of the ocean is leading to fundamental changes in the chemistry of seawater. And that's making it much more difficult for organisms to calcify. And that's particularly important when we get to the Great Barrier Reef where we'll revisit that issue. We know that fisheries are now targeting krill resources. And this is during a period of rapid climate change when we know that krill stocks are declining as a result of the loss of sea ice. In addition to that, as more and more people get to Antarctica, there's an increased pollution risk. And some of our team have been involved in showing that the fuels that are used around Antarctica are in fact very toxic to Antarctic marine life. What we need is much more effective international management of this extraordinary resource. As these humpback whales start to migrate into warmer waters, they face increasing threats from noise pollution, seismic surveys, vessel strike, coastal development and various forms of pollution. And they're also facing changes in terms of the temperature and the currents that are flowing down along the coastline. For example, the East Australian current is flowing further south and warming the waters down even as far as Tasmania. As a result of that, we've started to lose a lot of other marine resources. And for example, the giant kelp forests that used to be very abundant there have declined to the point where we now have listed them as an endangered ecological community. As they go further north, past Byron Bay, and this has been a fantastic site for our researchers to look at the population increase in recent decades, 
We know that they are now facing increasing coastal development and industrialisation. That's leading to increased port development and increased shipping. This has become a serious concern for the World Heritage Committee who have recently come out to have a look at what's going on in the Great Barrier Reef because they're concerned about the World Heritage status, status and the outstanding universal values of the Great Barrier Reef being threatened. These changes along the coast of Queensland are probably slightly less significant directly for humpback whales, but they are very significant for some other marine mammal species. They're particularly significant for dugongs and the seagrasses they rely on, and the, along the Queensland coast, the dugong population is critically endangered. They are also important for some of our inshore dolphin species. The snubfin dolphin, the Australian snubfin dolphin, is the first recognised endemic dolphin species in Australia. And the southernmost population of snubfin dolphins occurs just off the Fitzroy River in central Queensland. And unfortunately, their core habitat is exactly where there are plans to build yet another port just up from the port of Gladstone. And that would cause serious impacts to that particular population. As they migrate further and further north into the warmer waters, into the Great Barrier Reef, they move into their breeding ground area. And the extraordinary thing is that after all these years of work on humpback whales by many different research teams around Australia, we still don't actually know exactly where within the Great Barrier Reef humpback whales aggregate to breed. It's one of the many undiscovered things about their ecology. The Great Barrier Reef is an extraordinary place. It's a World Heritage property, consists of more than 3,000 individual reefs and more than 900 different islands. And it stretches for more than 2,000 kilometres along the coast of Queensland. It's a World Heritage Biodiversity Hotspot and therefore we are required to manage the Great Barrier Reef in terms of a global context. The Great Barrier Reef is actually extremely valuable to Australia. It's worth more than $5 billion a year to the Australian economy. The majority of that value through ecotourism related activities. We know that coral reefs like the Great Barrier Reef and these big systems are formed primarily by reef building corals, which is one of the things that I've spent a long time looking at. And we know that corals are really important, but we also know that they are very fragile and very fussy about their environment. The good news is that corals and coral reef systems are naturally very resilient. So when they are damaged by things such as cyclone activity or flood events or things like that, given sufficient time, they can return to a very uh, biodiverse system. But they need time to recover from these disturbances. So what we do know about them is that they're fragile, they're resilient, but given time they will recover. The problem is that they are increasingly threatened by a range of different activities. Some of the key threats to the Great Barrier Reef and other reefs around the world are obviously climate change. Increased sea temperatures by just one and a half to two degrees lead to mass bleaching episodes. And when they are prolonged, that can lead to very significant coral mortality. We also know that that absorption of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere changes the chemistry of the seawater and makes it much harder for corals and other calcifying organisms in order to create their calcium carbonate skeletons. It actually also increases the rate at which these reefs start to dissolve. Coupled with that are cyclone impacts, ongoing crown of thorns sea star outbreaks, which have destroyed a lot of the coral communities in the central and southern Great Barrier Reef in recent years. Coupled with a lot more pollution coming into the system from coastal development along the Queensland coast, and in some cases overfishing. The problem for the reef and this last important breeding area for the humpback whales is that climate change models of course predict increased frequency and severity of sea temperature anomalies leading to mass coral bleaching and increased severity of cyclones. So we've seen as we've travelled 
along the Blue Highway that our humpback whales face multiple threats from Antarctica to the Great Barrier Reef. Some of these threats are very broad scale, things like climate change, changes to ocean current, etc. But some of them are much more manageable and occur at very local scales. And that's where we need to focus a lot more attention in future. We know that our marine systems are resilient and given time, many of them will recover. But we also know that there's increasing human pressures and populations along our coastline. What we need to do is learn from the mistakes of things such as unregulated whaling, which led to an almost catastrophic decline in whales in the Southern Hemisphere last century. We need a much more precautionary approach in terms of managing our biodiversity resources. We understand a lot about the problems. What we need are much more intelligent applications of the science we do know in creating better solutions. I feel that when we have knowledge, it leads to increased understanding. But when we have increased understanding, it leads to increased responsibility. And hopefully all of you have grown a little bit in your knowledge, a bit more in your understanding. But the corollary of that is you also have a greater responsibility to do something about it. Hopefully all of you can be agents of change for the good in terms of protecting Australia's extraordinary and unique biodiversity, both on land and at sea, for our Blue Planet's future. Thank you very much for listening.